Well, grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. This past August, I had my very first experience with the process of jury selection. <laughs> I received my summons sometime this past summer and I had to push back the date that was selected originally for me at least a few times because of either conflicts with work. I mean, summers when you, when you travel with all the students and things like that for various trips. But then I also had some personal trips uh, celebrating some things back home. But finally, uh, the date arrived and I could no longer push it back anymore. I was set to do it at the end of August and I had no idea what to expect, but I can honestly say, with a little bit of fear of saying this in such a public way, I guess, I didn't hate it. <laughs> I didn't hate the jury summons process. I didn't love the fact that I was there, down there in the city, uh, which for those in spring, I mean, that's about 45 minutes to get down there, and I was there in the place for jury, the whole process from 8 a.m. until about 5.30 p.m. Didn't love that part, but I didn't hate it overall. To me, it was a very fascinating process. The morning started sitting in a room with everyone who showed up, everyone who had received the summons for that day to be placed in one of the number of selections that were going to be going on that day. And a number of us then from those original rooms uh, sitting there waiting were called into various hallways at that point because the whole process of selection of actually picking the final folks that were going to be on a jury was about to begin and we were the the lucky ones i guess who made the the first cuts well it was there in that hallway that again the the fascinating process at least for me began uh, we were given some a little bit of information about the case that we would be in the process for summoning a jury for it was a civil case not a criminal one. And uh, there was a little advice given to us too that I found kind of humorous that was basically often the folks who talk more, who share more of their opinions, are the ones that aren't picked for a jury summons. Just a little fun fact for you. And the ones who don't speak or really never offer an opinion are the ones that often do get chosen. It was certainly true for us that day. Well. Eventually from that hallway, we make our way upstairs to one of the top floors, beautiful views of the city on each side of the hallway that we were in. And we make our way into the courtroom. And yes, it was my first time in a courtroom. I'd watched them on shows. I love crime shows, but it was my first time really being in one myself. And we, we all sit there, we file into rows to begin this process. And again, I found the whole thing just fascinating and, and dare I say, a little delightful because of how interesting it was to me. The judge began by explaining what we could expect from the day and, and taught just for a moment on the judicial process and why it's such a vital piece of our whole governing process here in America. I found myself a little bit inspired by this judge. And then it began. Each party, <clears throat> each side of the case, the lawyers get the opportunity then, and this is what we spend our day doing, just asking us questions, getting to know each of us. And along the way, the cool thing is you start to pick up a little bit about what this case must be about, even though they can't really say anything so as to not injure the process. Well, what's the goal then of that whole process? Why do they ask all of these questions? You see, these lawyers are trying to get to know us in order to discern with joint efforts between them and the judge, which dozen or so folks in the room will be the most helpful in discovering the truth in the case and which ones need to be weeded out of the process because their preconceived notions that they're bringing with them into the courtroom or their backgrounds, right, and everything that goes with or all of our personal histories, which ones are gonna prevent us from being fair jurors because you only want to hear what you already know to be true, or at least what you think to be true because of your, your history. And y'all, like I said, you get to learn a little bit about the case. And this case, from what I could gather at least, was, like the process itself, fascinating, okay? Again, it was a civil case, and yes, because I was not selected, right? They told us as soon as we left the room, we could talk about whatever we wanted because I wasn't selected. And because the, the trial is now over, I can share freely about it. And basically, one party was suing the other party for legal malpractice, okay? So they'd had these folks as lawyers, and they felt like they didn't do a good job, something, something like that. 
So as these lawyers are starting to ask us these questions, they really wanted to hear about how we felt about two particular issues. Again, listening for ways that we might be biased in this case, ways in which we may not be able to process the evidence and discover the truth because of what we were already bringing into the room that day from our own lives and experiences. And what were those two issues? Well, one, how we felt about legal or, or malpractice lawsuits in general, and whether it's okay to hold white collar folks, uh, doctors, lawyers, things like that accountable, and what was our opinion on the existence of common law marriage in Texas. Again, y'all, fascinating. And in that room was a great representation of our city here in Houston. It was so diverse, and with that diversity came a diversity of opinions. Right On the issue of malpractice, you had people in the room who were themselves white-collar workers, were doctors or counselors or lawyers, or we had a judge sitting right in the row in front of me. Uh, or you had a family member. We had plenty of people in the room with family members who were in those occupations. And then you had people that didn't trust lawyers at all. Right, And all these opinions are coming out with all of these questions. When it came to the common law conversation, again, a fascinating one, because we had one guy who was himself in a common law marriage or understood himself to be at a common law marriage. A number of folks in the room with family members or close family friends who were in common law marriage and a number of folks in the room who were completely against the idea of common law marriage, even if it is legal in Texas, some for religious reasons and other so who, who made it very clear they had no particular religious affiliation or desire to have one, but they were still against it, even if it was legal in Texas. Again, fascinating day. And I learned, I learned so much. Speaking of which, one more thing before we dive into 2 Timothy together. That's our focus for today from chapter 4. Each of these lawyers on both sides had some teaching that they wanted to do themselves on, on what our perspectives should be when coming in and considering a civil case. Again, I learned something. I didn't know all the different ins and outs of things. Again, this wasn't a a criminal case, that's in a different building, I learned. This was a civil case, which is, again, something like suing folks or, thankfully, not custody. That would have been a tough one to be able to wrestle with, right? From the lawyers on the one side, we learned that in a criminal case, the burden of proof is uh, is not the same as in a uh, or, or in a criminal case. Criminal and civil are different. In a criminal case, it has to be what you hear on the TV shows— beyond a reasonable doubt, which means there's no other reasonable explanation that can come from the evidence that's prevented or presented at the trial. Meanwhile, in a civil case, the burden of proof is proving that their case are proving their case by a preponderance of the evidence, such fun words, which means basically the plaintiff needs merely to show that whatever the fact is in dispute is more likely, than any of the others, right? Not beyond a reasonable doubt, not like this is the only possible solution, but just in general, I would believe it more than the other side, okay? At least that was my understanding, okay? And that was one side. Meanwhile, on the other side, the other group of lawyers, uh, they're sitting there and they wanted to teach a little. They shared with us that, again, this is the way I took it, so I apologize to anybody in the legal world. This was a very new thing to me. In a court of law, in a civil case especially, Merely saying that someone did something is not enough to declare someone guilty. And I found this kind of interesting, all right? And I wasn't completely tracking because of all the discussion that was going on as they were asking various people questions. So I spoke up, right? And because that was the advice that we got for clarification. I shared that in a former life, I was a camp director, okay? So if Johnny came up and told me that Billy stole his lollipop, right? And then uh, Billy said, no, I didn't. In a court of law, Billy's not guilty, right? Just because Johnny said it doesn't make it true, right? What needs to happen? An investigation. Johnny needs to tell me why he believes it. And then I have to discern for myself as a camp director, right, or in a legal court of law, whether or not Billy actually stole the lollipop because of the evidence Get it, at least in the or given, at least in the American legal system. Again, just because someone says something doesn't make it true. Evidence is needed. An investigation of the facts 
has to go with it so that you can find the truth. And so everybody asks themselves, why in the world are you sharing all this stuff with us? Because it's my deepest hope and desire in this moment as a brother in Christ to you and for many of you as your pastor, that you would live your life in such a way that you are earnestly seeking, looking for, desiring, and honoring the truth in every aspect of your life. And before I continue, as fascinating as I found that trial, maybe you do too, I'm going to ask you to set aside all those details to focus in on, on again, what we came here to talk about. Again, set aside malpractice lawsuits, civil versus criminal courts. Set aside the question of, I wonder what Pastor Lee said and how he answered all those questions. Or for the lawyers in the room, set aside the fact of you're saying to yourself, yeah, he didn't get all that legal stuff right. Instead, focus on what's in front of us. These, these words from 2 Timothy 4 that are going to ask us this question. Have you found lately that you're earnestly seeking, desiring, honoring, looking for the truth in every aspect of your life? Or have you found your ears to be itching for whatever you want to hear? Have you found yourself being a little biased carrying something with you that you probably need to let go of. You see, that itching ears is the language that Paul uses in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Notably, again, the, the final words we have of the Apostle Paul, the final chapter that he writes that we have in Scripture as he's writing from his house arrest in Rome. And he's writing these words to a young pastor, a guy named Timothy. That's why it's called 2 Timothy, because that's who it's being written. And Timothy's a guy who shepherded the church in Ephesus. And what does Paul have to say? What advice does he have for this young pastor and his final words for him, and really his final words for the, the church at large and throughout time? These are those words, starting in verse 1. I solemnly charge you, before God in Christ Jesus, who's going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires— will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now, before you try and get yourself off the hook, because that's what I would try and do here. I'd like to keep you there. As tempting as it might be to hear these words from Paul and say, boy, oh boy, Paul was right. People these days, they're not tolerating sound doctrine. They're listening to whatever they want to hear. They're turning away from the truth and only listening to myths. Before you say that, I want to remind you that I'm not here to talk about people today I'm here to talk to you and ask you to consider yourself. Today's a day to ask yourself, brother or sister in Christ, are you only hearing what you want to hear? Are you creating a teacher or teachers for yourself? And have you turned away from the truth? Maybe, right, as is often the case, without even realizing it. And I want you to consider that question on two fronts. The first of those fronts is probably what you're, you're you probably are getting on the surface of, of Paul's words here. When it comes to just general truth in your world, who's teaching you? Who is it that gets to dictate what truth is in your life? And I've got a pretty pointed question for the culture that we're living in, right? Because we're living in it, this is why I'm asking you. 
Is it a politician? <laughs> you wouldn't be alone if it was. I've said for a while now that I believe American politics is the fastest growing religion in America. And again, I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm, I'm here to talk about how often we lean on political discourse, political conversations to dictate so many different things in our lives when well, maybe we should be listening to God. <laughs> Just consider the first commandment. It says, you shall have no other gods. And Martin Luther poses this question after each of the commandments as he talked about them. He said, what, is, what does that first commandment mean? And he answers it. He says, he says, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? It means that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So as you consider that, I mean, the question that, that just naturally comes out of that is, what is it that you fear, love, and trust in most? There's a good chance your answer to that question will give you a really good idea about who is teaching you lately. Who's the one that gets to dictate truth for your life? It's going to tell you who you're listening to most. I've seen it over and over again when it comes to politics, right? It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. When the other team is winning something, anything, any office I've seen, it's almost as if people's worlds start crashing down. Maybe you've been there. You feel like the world is over because somebody else won. And why? Why does your world come crashing down? If, if Again, if it's politics, some of you guys are like, no, I totally see what you're saying. Some of you guys are going, oh, no, that might be me, right? The question is, is God king or not? Is Jesus Christ Lord or not? And that's not a bad question to consider either. It's certainly one that I use with our confirmation process as we look into the commandments, as we look at commandment number one. What is it that can make your world crumble and come crashing down? And I'm not talking about like stuff that wrecks all of us, right? I'm saying, and I'm not trying to dismiss things in your life that could, could really wreck things going on, like the death of a loved one. I mean, fair enough. That breaks God's heart too. That's why he did something about it so that, that that wouldn't be the end of the story. But, but, but I'm talking about what else? What else can you hear or what else can happen in your life that makes it feel like everything else is just crumbling down? Is it what somebody said? Is it, is it harm to your reputation because of what somebody said? Is it because a sin was exposed and all of a sudden we're like, oh no, my whole world is crumbling down because someone else's opinion or what's sitting on the throne of our life? What about how someone feels about you, right? Are you just, you want someone to like you, they're just not liking you. How about the loss of a, a possession? Stuff that's gonna just rust away one day as Jesus tells us in, in Matthew, right? Maybe the loss of a job, again, a serious thing. I mean, hear me clearly. I'm not trying to dismiss how hurtful or harmful are just painful some of these things can be. I'm merely trying to help you get at the heart of who's sitting on the throne of your life, right? If your world crumbles or you, there's a temptation for it to completely collapse when something like that happens, ask yourself, who is my teacher? Who holds truth in front of me and I listen to it? Who are the teachers of your life? If it's not God, if it's not his truth, his grace, his good news, his plan for not just your life, but for this world to make all things new again, that he's coming back to set right or wrong things right, right? If it's not that, right? And that grace that, that sets you free, that gives you that good news that he's ushered into this world of freedom that the rest of this world can't understand because we trust in him. He holds the truth that this is none of this stuff is the end, right? Uh, then I hope Paul's words can bring you back to the center and allow you to ask yourself that question. Are your ears itching to hear what you want to hear rather than submitting to or honoring or discerning the truth. Yes, this world is full of lies and untruths, like how someone else's words can somehow rule my life or that the loss of 
of anything could somehow ruin my life too. Those are all lies that somehow the world has taught us to, the devil has taught us to, our own sinful nature and, and pride and all this other stuff have taught us to listen to. But how many of those untruths and lies do we listen to without investigating anything? How many of those myths and lies pull us so far from the truth? Again, I hope these words bring it back a little bit to the truth that God places in front of us. And and that also brings me to the second front. I said there are two fronts that I want us to look at this from, right? On the one hand, we've got how, how lies and myths become our teachers, sometimes without us even realizing it, right? That's totally normal, right? It's, it's very, uh, sneaky. It's very sneaky for those lies and those myths to creep into our lives. And I think we can all acknowledge how harmful uh, blind submission to those lies and those myths can be. But on the other front that we've got, we've got lies and myths, but we've also got gossip, which can ju- be just as, as harmful and deadly. Friends, do you find yourself in a place where your ears are itching to hear the worst about someone? Anyone, even strangers, even celebrities, you know? It always surprises me why we, not only as Christians, but as human beings, tolerate conversations that just completely throw people's reputations into the mud, right? Harm them. Like, people can't think well of them after certain words are shared. I mean, I am all about accountability. I said that in my my question and at jury summons. I'm all about Writing wrongs and justice in all shapes and sizes. That's why I love crime shows. But it breaks my heart to watch people's reputations so carelessly and casually destroyed on the lips of people, especially God's people, just because they they heard something that sounded kind of true or read something or maybe even was involved in something and they know it to be true. But sometimes, most of the time, those words are passed along and people are just dipping in the Kool-Aid without knowing the flavor. The clear picture isn't there most of the time, but your ears are finding themselves itching to just want to know more and your mouth starts to say more, and that's gossip. Ask yourself, is a person's reputation safe on your lips? Are you treating other people's reputations the same way that you would hope They're treating yours, especially when you've made a mistake or you've done something wrong. Are you putting the best construction on everything and explaining everything to the best of your ability in the kindest way? That's what God calls you and I to do when our ears are itching. And hear me clearly, if you are genuinely concerned about something you saw or something that was said to you, or something that you may know to be true, and it's just bad, do what God calls you to do. Bring it to the brother or sister in Christ in a conversation so that accountability can be there. It does no good to go to anyone else in that situation because your brother or sister may be. It's very often the case that they're often completely clueless. And if for some reason going to that person doesn't work. That's where God says, okay, now it's time to go and bring someone else with you. Go find another brother or sister to go with you. Explain to them the situation. Say to them, I've gone to them. I still don't think this has been fixed. I don't think this wrong has been righted. And then it's the invitation for the three of you to come together to help that person right a wrong, but not to let a community try and do it all at the start. That only harms a a, a community. It only harms a person's reputation. Every single one of us needs folks like that in our lives to carry our reputations with respect and love and to care about the accountability that God calls us to, accountability that corrects and restores. Will you give the people in your life that kind of care and love and accountability? Will you honor what God expects? Will you seek the truth, or will you keep satisfying 
your itching ears. And I recognize, as I say this, I talk about the two fronts that are in front of all of us. I recognize there's a lot of law, right? There's a lot of conviction coming at you today. And I know that because I felt that same conviction as, as I wrote these words down, as, as I'm saying them out loud to you. But here clearly, what I hope that law can do, the law of God, that conviction, it's kind of like curbs on the road, okay? That's one way to describe it. As you're driving on the road, you can be pretty thankful for curbs, or those, even those little rumble strips uh, as you're driving down the road because they show you that you're veering off of the path. Okay, and sometimes it's a curb. If you find yourself going up over a curb, it can be like very jarring, okay? It can even hurt sometimes, like, oh gosh! And you wanna get right back on the road as, as quick as possible. That's what the law of God does for us. It reminds us, right? Because if we go off the road, we're not only risking harm to ourselves, we're risking harm to other people too, okay? And that's why, why those curbs are there, to get, get us back on the road. And for those, that, those, those of you that are, that are hearing what we said today and you're feeling a little beat up a little bit, that's okay, right? I, I, I have good news for you. I have great news for you. The blood of Jesus covers every single one of those times where your ears have itched and you've listened to other teachers or you've entertained or spoken gossip. God forgives you, right? That's why Jesus came into this world to free you from letting that past somehow weigh you down. God forgives you and he loves you. And now his invitation is simply this. Get back on the road, friend, and let God's word, his truth, be your teacher and guide as you go about this week. Weigh the evidence when it comes to different things and seek to honor God with what you're listening to, what you're itching to hear, and honor him as that sole teacher in your life with both your words and who you listen to. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.